abortive transduction abortive transduction refers to the introduction of transcriptionally competent but non-replicating segments of foreign genetic material into a bacterial cell by a transducing phage known as bacterial virus a transducing phage is one capable of packaging dna which is not its own into phage capsids usually at low frequency once injected into a recipient cell the transduced dna fragment has three possible fates it can be degraded it can recombine with the recipient chromosome or plasmid resulting in a stable change in the bacterial genotype known as complete transduction or it can establish itself as a non-replicating genetic element that is segregated to only one of the two daughter cells at each division known as abortive transduction establishment of an abortive transducing fragment may involve protein mediated circularization of the entering linear fragment Abortive transduction was first described in the 1950s by among others B A D Stalker J Lederberg and H Ozeki particularly informative were Stalker's transductional uh, analysis of motility mutants of Salmonella typhimurium using P22 motile cells embedded in semisolid agar can swim away from a growing colony and multiply further forming a large circular swarm of cells but a non-motile mutant strain for example lacking flagella multiples multiplies in place forming a small circular colony a suitable abortively transduced wild type dna can complement the motility mutation allowing the formerly non-motile cell to swim however non-motile daughter cells are generated during the swim and remain in place where the father multiply this results in a compact colony descendants of the first daughter cell with a trial of cells emanating from it later descendants of the abortively transduced swimming cell nutritional markers for example mutations abolishing the ability to synthesize an amino acid can also be abortively transduced resulting in very small colonies on minimal media lacking the required nutrient such markers have been used to study the pr- the process of abortive transduction using p1 in s ericaceae coli and p22 in s typhimurium Abortive transduction is in fact more frequent than complete transduction as many as 90% of all transducing fragments introduced into cells become established as abortive transductants while about 2% form complete transductants the physical nature of abortive transduction has been studied by sandry and berger by smiger and by others one method uses infection of unlabeled cells with phage grown on bacteria with labeled dna The fate of the labeled DNA can be followed by separation according to density for heavy radioactive non-radioactive isotopes such as N15 only about 10 to 15% of the label in the fragments become physically associated with the unlabeled chromosome either by recombination or by nucleotide recycling the remaining label is not degraded and can be quantitatively recovered for at least 5 hours after introduction This persistent state is consistent with the genetic observation that the DNA can complement defective chromosomal genes for many generations. Complete transduction occurs within the first hour of introduction. Physical protection of the abortive fragments from host nucleases appears to result from protein association with the with the DNA. Abortive transducing DNA labeled with heavy isotopes displayed an accelerated sedimentation velocity consistent with a supercoil circular form. when isolated when reisolated from recipient cells semi semi sedimentation velocity was restored to normal by protease treatment in the p22 system a particular phage protein has been implicated in the protection process p22 gene 16 mutants yield fewer abortive transductants but normal numbers of complete transductants it is thought that the protein is packaged within the dna in the capsid and injected with the transducing fragment The biological impact of this process is hard to assess. Its frequency in nature is unknown. It could in principle have the effect of allowing escape from a stressful condition for enough time for the cell to acquire a new mutational adaptation or to find a new environment without leaving a permanent genetic record of the event. Achondroplasia. Achondroplasia is the most common form of disproportionate short stature. or dwarfism with an estimated incidence of 1 per 20,000 to 30,000 live births 
This, this type of dwarfism has been recognized for more than 4000 years and can be seen depicted in many ancient statues and drawings. Achondroplasia is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait with approximately 75% of cases representing new dominant mutations. The molecular defects underlying achondroplasia have recently been elucidated and comprise heterozygous mutations in the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 or FGFR3 gene located on the short arm of chromosome 4. This gene encodes the tyrosine kinase cell surface receptor and one specific gain of function mutation G1138A resulting in a glycine to arginine substitution in the transmembrane domain of FGFR3 is responsible for the vast majority approximately 98% of cases and is the most common known muta mutation in the humans. The diagnosis of achondroplasia is usually made at or around birth based on typical appearance of these infants comprising disproportionate short stature with short limbs, especially the most proximal rhizomelic segments, redundant folds of skin overlying the shortened limbs, short and broad hands and feet with a trident configuration of the digits. A shortened thorax with relatively long abdomen, limitation of elbow extension and a characteristic facial ex uh, appearance with, with a disproportionately large head, prominent forehead, depressed nasal bridge, flat mid face and a short upturned nose. The clinical diagnosis is confirmed by the specific radiographic features of the condition with, which include a large skull with relatively small cranial base, narrow foramen magnum short flat vertebral bodies lack of normal increase in interpediculate distance from upper limb uh, lumbar vertebrae caudally short pedicles with narrow vertebral canal square shaped iliac wings short narrow sciatic notches flat acetabular roof short limbs with short thick tubular bones broad and short metacarpals and phalanges fibular overgrowth and short ribs the diagnosis of achondroplasia can now be made before birth by molecular testing for the specific FGFR3 mutation in families with a prior history of the condition. Like many uh, other skeletal dysplasias, the diagnosis of achondroplasia can be suspected by the use of prenatal ultrasonography, although it cannot be made until relative, relatively late in pregnancy because shortening of the long bones become, becomes manifest only after 24 weeks of gestation. Hypochondroplasia and thanatophor thanatophoric dysplasia are related conditions also due to mutations in the FGFR3 gene. However, achondroplasia can be readily distinguished from these as the changes in hydro hypochondroplasia are milder and those in thanatophoric dysplasia much more severe and among invariably lethal and almost invariably lethal. The majority of individuals with achondroplasia are of normal intelligence, have a normal lifespan and lead independent and productive lives. These individuals, however, face many potential medical, psychosocial and architectural challenges secondary to their abnormal skeletal development and subsequent disproportionate st short stature. The mean final adult height in achondroplasia is 130 cm for men and 125 cm for women and specific growth charts have been developed to document and track linear growth, head circumference and weight in these individuals. Human growth hormone and other drug therapies have not been effective in significantly increasing final adult stature in achondroplasia. Recently, surgical limb lengthening procedures have been employed successfully to increase length by up to 30 cm. There are many potential medical problems that a person with achondroplasia may experience during his or her life. In early infancy, the most potentially serious of these is compression of the cervicomedullar spinal cord secondary to a narrow foramen magnum, cervical spinal canal or both. This complication may be manifest clinically by symptoms and signs of high cervical myelio, uh, myelopathy central apnea or profound hypotonia and motor delay and may in some instances requires decompressive neurosurgery. Other potential complications in infancy include significant nasal obstruction that may lead to sleep apnea in a minority 5% of cases, development of a thoracolumbar kyphosis, 
which usually re resolves upon weight bearing and hydrocephalus in a small proportion of cases 1% during the first two years of life which may require shunting from early childhood and as the child begins to walk several orthopedic manifestations may, may evolve including progressive bowing of the legs due to fibular overgrowth, development of lumbar lordosis and hip flexion contra, uh, contractures, recurrent ear infections with ensuring chronic serious uh, serous otitis media are uh, common complications at this time and may lead to conductive hearing loss with consequent delayed speech and language development. The older child with achondroplasia commonly develops dental malocclusion secondary to a disproportionate cranial base with subsequent crowding of teeth and crossbite. The main potential medical complication of the adult with achondroplasia is lumbar spinal canal stenosis with impingement on the spinal cord roots. This complication may be manifested by lower limb pain and parasthesia, bladder or bowel dysfunction and neurological signs and may require decompressive surgery. Throughout their lives, some people with achondroplasia may experience a variety of psychosocial challenges. These, are, these can be addressed by specialized medical and social support of the individual and family, appropriate anticipatory guidance and by interaction with patient support groups such as the Little People of the America. Acrosome The acrosome is a vesicle overlying the nucleus of both invertebrate and vertebrate sperm composed of non-enzymatic and enzymatic proteins generally arranged as a matrix. These proteins have been demonstrated in some cases to play specific roles in the fertilization process. The contents of the acrosome are released prior to sperm egg fusion in a regulated secretory event called the acrosome reaction. The morphology of the acrosome varies between species and the mechanics of the acrosome reaction vary widely between invertebrates and vertebrates. This chapter will focus specifically on the ac acrosome of mammalian sperm. The acrosome is a product of the Golgi complex and is synthesized and assembled during spermiogenesis. The contents of the acrosome include structural and non-structural, non-enzymatic and enzymatic components and this secretory vesicle is delimited by both linear and outer acrosomal membranes. These components appear to play important roles in the establishment and maintenance of the acrosomal matrix, in the dispersion of the acrosomal matrix, in the penetration of the eggs zona uh, pellucida and uh, possibly in, 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 the, in the interaction between the sperm and the egg plasma membranes. This vesicle is finally confined with the plasma membrane overlying the entire sperm surface. There remain several questions pertaining to the formation and maturation of this organelle. For example, all the prominent biogenesis of the acrosome occurs during the Golgi and Cap phases of spermiogenesis. It is not clear when it is during this developmental process that this organelle actually starts to develop. Furthermore, the acrosome is composed of multiple component proteins, but little is known regarding whether the synthesis of all of these components occurs at the same time or whether synthesis is occurred and coordinate. Experimental evidence to date suggests the later mechanism. The mechanisms by which these acrosomal components are targeted to this organelle during biogenesis are also not known. Although spermatogenic cells possess functional mano 6 phosphate insulin like growth factors 2 factor 2 receptors it is not clear whether, whether these receptors play a role in the transport of glycoproteins to the acrosome or whether targeting occurs primarily through the default pathway seen in the transport of proteins in other secretory systems finally once these components are packaged into the acrosome the functional significance of additional processing of these components that is post-translational modifications movement within the organelle etc during sperm residence in the testis and or during residence in the extratesticular male reproductive organs for example epididymide, uh, epididymis vas uh, difference is not clear. In some species, species, for example, guinea pig, mouse, the formation of specific protein domains within the acrosome has been clearly demonstrated, but the mechanism by which the compartmentalization is established is poorly understood and an understanding of the biological role of this compartmentalization is only starting to be realized. Answers to all of these questions will not 
will no doubt become apparent when a systematic evaluation of these proteins comprising the acrosome is undertaken with respect to transcription, translation and post-translational modifications. An understanding of these process, process may greatly further uh, farther one knowledge of the role of the acrosome in fertilization since it is becoming apparent that, 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 that this secretory vesicle this secretory vesicles uh, may have multiple functions it should be it should also be noted that individuals whose sperm have poorly formed acrosomes or lack acrosomes altogether display infertility this speaks to the importance of this organelle in the normal fertilization process in, e in any event, studies focused on the synthesis and processing of acrosomal components should be considered in the context of the acrosome functioning as a secretory granule and not a modified lysosome as has been historically suggested. Although the fusion of the plasma membrane overlying the acrosome and the outer acrosomal membrane constitutes the acrosome reaction, it must be emphasized that this process is very complex and likely involves many of the steps constituting regulated exocytotic processes in other cell types. Such steps might include membrane priming, docking, and fusion. Therefore, this process can also be referred to as acrosomal exocytosis. Recent data support the idea that sperm uh, capacitation, an extracellular maturational process that normally occurs in the female reproductive tract and confers fertilization comp competence to the sperm may comprise signal transduction events that ready the plasma and outer acrosomal membranes for subsequent fusion during the process of acrosomal exocytosis. Acrosomal exocytosis is regulated by ligand-induced signal transduction events in which the physiologically relevant ligand is the zona pellucida and oocyte-specific extracellular matrix. Specific components of the zona pellucida are responsible for species-specific binding of the sperm and subsequent ac acrosomal exocytosis. These events are likely mediated by sperm membrane-associated uh, zona pellucida binding proteins and or receptors. The identity and mode of action of such proteins is still quite controversial. Resultant exocytosis involves the point fusion and vesiculation of the plasma membrane overlying the acrosome with the outer acrosomal membrane thus creating hybrid membrane vesicles. The molecular mechanisms involved in this fusion and vesiculation process are not known. The resultant fusion of these membranes leads to the subsequent exposure of the acrosomal contents to the extracellular environment. Both the exposed soluble and insoluble components of the acrosome may play important roles in the binding of the acrosome related sperm to the zona pellucida as well as the subsequent penetration of the acrosome reacted sperm through the zona pellucida. Although this exocytotic event can be induced by both physiological stimuli and pharmacological agents, the molecular mechanisms by which these different stimuli and agents function to induce exocytosis may be dramatically different. Adaptive Landscapes Overview The genetic determination of fitness is complex involving a large number of loci with numerous interactions. In 1932, Sewell Wright depicted this myriad of effects as a two-dimensional view of peaks and valleys that represented fitness levels of multi-locus genotypes. In this version of an adaptive landscape, a gene combination landscape, the horizontal and vertical axis represent genetic dimensions and fitness, which is known as selective value, is indicated by contours that are lines representing elevation differences as found on a topographic map. As envisioned by Wright, a gene combination landscape could, could consist of many thousands of peaks of various elevations uh, separated by valleys and saddles. Individual genotypes are represented by single points and populations as clouds of points that are typically found on or near an adaptive peak. Adaptive evolution translates into local hill climbing and shifts to higher peaks can only occur through fitness reductions as populations traverse valleys or saddles. The rugged genetic topography is due to the prevalence of genetic interactions such that many different gene combinations can produce high fitness phenotypes. The paradigm of an adaptive landscape is a key element of Wright's shifting balance theory of evolution. Where, whereby species undergo shifts among fitness peaks. Adaptive landscapes as described by Wright. Early in his career, 
Wright's work with animal breeding programs lead him to the conclusion that interactions among loci or epistasis were common and that individual characters could be influenced by a number of genetic factors known as pleiotropy. He considered evolution to be a process of selection on networks of independent genetic factors rather than on single loci with independent effects, a view which is emphasized by R. A. Fisher. With thousands of loci, the assumption of strong genetic interactions naturally leads to the conclusion that there must be multiple fitness optima, each of which represents a unique genetic combination. Hence, epistasis produces a rugged adaptive landscape with multiple peaks and valleys as opposed to a single fi fitness optimum, optimum which would be expected if all combinations of loci acted in a purely adaptive fashion purely additive fashion with a two-dimensional projection in inadequate to is in, in inadequate to represent such as complex such a complex mi multi-dimensional genotypic space Wright's view of an adaptive landscape has served as an important heuristic tool for understanding evolutionary processes evolution and on rugged adaptive landscapes Wright used depictions of adaptive landscapes to demonstrate several features of evolution. He pointed out that very large populations would be more likely to be found near the top of an adaptive peak because the influence of selection would be much greater than the effects of genetic drift, that is random variations in popula population allele frequencies among generations. Very small populations, on the other hand, would tend to undergo severe inbreeding and by chance could become fixed for non-optimal genetic combinations, in which case they would be depicted as single points that had drifted to lower positions on the fitness surface. Wright proposed that populations that were small enough to allow some drift but large enough to avoid severe inbreeding would, would occasionally shift far enough from the local optimum to come under the influence of a different adaptive peak. In this way, species could explore the fitness surface by continually making transitions to ever higher peaks. Wright argued that this process would be facilitated if a species were divided into a large number of small proportions, populations connected by low levels of gene flow, a concept which came to be known as the shifting balance theory. The rugged topography of the landscape is a consequence of, 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 of epistasis as well as genotype by environment interaction. Hence, with changes in the environment, previously fit genetic combinations may be rendered uh, maladaptive and is an, in fluctuating environments, populations will constantly be subjected to selection of variable intensity and direction. Gene Frequency Landscapes The gene combination adaptive landscape described above has been subjected to criticism because the axes are difficult to define in a concise manner. As a consequence, most evolutionary biologists have regarded this model of the, of the fitness landscape as a metaphor with heuristic rather than analytical value. In his later years, Wright changed his de depiction of an adaptive landscape to represent a fitness surface for combinations of two different loci. In this version of the adaptive landscape, each axis is defined as the frequency of a single allele and points on the surface represent the mean fitness of a population with a unique combination of gene frequencies. In effect, there are innumerable gene frequency landscapes in the original gene combination landscape, each of which represents a single pair of genes. Gene frequency surfaces have the advantage of being amenable to analytical methods and have been used to provide insights into conditions that promote peak shifts. Phenotypic landscapes Fitness surfaces that are based on genotypes often have limited utility because they there may be few situations where the allelic st states of fitness determining loci can be determined. Quantitative phenotypic traits, on the other hand, are generally much more accessible for empirical studies and a rich body of theory for the evolution of phenotypic characters have been developed. The concept of an adaptive landscape as a combination of two phenotypic characters was first induced by Carl Pearson in 1903 and elaborated by George Gaylord Simpson in 1944. In this case, the axes represent quantitative trait values and points on the fitness surface can represent either individuals or population means. This version of the adaptive landscape has been used extensively in the models of the evolution of quantitative traits. Hole landscapes 
when Wright developed the fitness surface metaphor, his ability to characterize a genotypic space with a large number of dimensions was hampered by the ability of appropriate analytical availability of appropriate analytical tools. In recent years, theoretical investigations of landscapes defined by a large number of loci have led to the realization that regions, referred to as neutral or nearly neutral networks connecting regions of high fitness, are a nature, natural feature of the multidimensional adaptive landscape. Hence, through mutation, recombination and genetic drift, populations can diverge by transver traversing high fitness networks without opposing selection. With extensive divergence, populations will eventually come to occupy opposite sides of regions of low fitness, a hole in the fitness landscape, in which, ca in which case they are reproductively isolated because of hybrid inability or incomparability of the parental genotypes. Like Wright's original fitness surface, the topography of whole landscapes is dependent on the prevalence of epistasis, but the existence of connecting regions facilitates evolution and divergence of population by small steps without the necessity of crossing valleys or saddles. Future Prospects As both metaphors and analytical constructs, adaptive landscapes will continue to be useful tools for understanding evolutionary process from both theoretical and empirical perspectives. The theory associated with fitness surfaces has made substantial advances in recent years, but empirical evidence supporting the topographies proposed in these models is sparse. Spears. The recent development of multidimensional models of adaptive landscapes with their, uh, with their more concise predictions concerning the genetic determination of mating barriers between divergent populations and taxa provides new foci to uh, for, for, for empirical investigations and an opportunity to refine our understanding of evolutionary processes.